So I think we need to operationalize what we're going to teach the next generation. You know, maybe our generation isn't really rescuable. The collapse has started, and it's causing big problems. Everything is falling apart, and, and we're in trouble. Our situation is getting worse. It's, it's like a building breaking down. We see signs of a complete breakdown happening. I mean, our systems are failing, and chaos is taking over. It's a mess, and we're struggling. So, yeah, the collapse is happening right before our eyes, and we can't ignore it. We gotta act quickly to prevent more damage. This is a critical moment, and we gotta face reality. The world is collapsing, and we are in for a tough time. We witness a major disaster affecting everybody. The damage is widespread, and there is no easy fix. We gotta come together and find solutions before it's too late. The collapse is a wake-up call. We are in for a difficult journey, and yeah, the signs are clear. We can't underestimate them. It is time to find a better future. I think it's clear that the level of autonomic arousal that's associated with emotions, either very high or very low, very happy or very sad, very anxious or very angry, clouds our judgment. They were designed to push us along certain behavioral paths, but they, they've grown in importance in the last few years. And, you know, we could get into a discussion about how, you know, social media marketing are designed to, you know, capture these very deep limbic aspects of ourselves, and they are. But what's amazing is, and important is that everybody has a forebrain. Uh, it, some people, mm -hmm. it seems there's more developed than others, but everybody has one. And we have this capacity for what we call top-down control, which is the ability to intervene in our own feeling states and our own action states and to set some some rigor and some some real clear marks that we're out to achieve. And I think it's going to start with the, the generation that's very plastic right now. Yeah. You know, w most parents are afraid of stressing their kids because they don't want to, you know, again, I went to a high school where kids literally at gun high school in the last 10 years, kids have, uh, you know, there've been over a dozen, you know, train track suicides. So those are kids that are committing suicide for different reasons, but a lot of them is because they just feel too much pressure. Mm. So obviously we can't, you know, we can't pressure kids beyond their capacity to, to regulate, but the idea that all of our internal states should be driven by external things, that's, that's a foolish misstep also. So I think we need to operationalize what we're gonna teach the next generation. You know, maybe our generation isn't really rescuable, but maybe the next generation is. And if they understand that there's some concepts that sound a little mushy, like gratitude or mindfulness or these kinds of things, but as long as they understand that, for instance, gratitude, which we didn't really touch on, involves a whole other neurotransmitter reward system in the brain, the serotonin system, which buffers us against injury. It can improve wound repair. It can allow us to lean back into these high stress regimes. Learning and you know, kids learning how to toggle their nervous system back and forth between highly you know, duration path outcome focused states of trying to improve and learn, and then learning how to really relax and chill mm -hmm. out and enjoy and be socially connected because it will allow them to ratchet back in and focus with mm -hmm. extreme depth. I think in doing that, we might not get every child to learn how to do that. But if we can distribute that information widely enough, if we can get that information out there, I really believe that at least a subset of those kids will grow up to be the leaders that our species really needs in order to get through this next filter. Mm. And right now we're feeling the stringency of that filter. And I think our level of autonomic dysregulation as a, as a species, the fact that we're there, we're here right now says, okay, here's the, here's the task. Are you guys going to figure yourselves out? You got this forebrain. My dog doesn't have the forebrain I've got. Yeah. He can't figure it out, but we can work this out. And it'll involve technologies like devices to measure how we're doing, maybe some machines to guide that. That's a different discussion, but I think it's entirely possible. And I think that's the evolutionary pressure that we're in right now. And I think that the next generation, if they can hear about it and learn about it, is going to meet that demand. Well, you know. I think it's clear that most people, young or old, are content to be passive consumers and spend out their dopamine yeah. doing essentially meaningless activities and consuming right. food and consuming air and light that is basically damaging to themselves. And they, I don't think they care.
I, I think there our species, let's be fair, our species is probably divided into those that are really going to try and maximize on this gift of neuroplasticity, right? We're the only species that has neuroplasticity throughout the lifespan. And that neuroplasticity in childhood lasts as long as it does as a function of our total lifespan. Mm. It's incredible. So we were gifted this. And I think some people leverage it and take advantage of it and other people don't. And I think we need to accept that we're not gonna get everybody. But what we need to do is attach the reward systems of society, financial, socioeconomic, et cetera, to the kinds of behaviors that are gonna, is gonna give rise to people that can lead us into the next 100 years and yeah. 200 years. Now that is not saying, oh, do away with monetary systems or do, actually the opposite. I think that once people start to realize that your high performing uh, military, elite military, your high performing athlete, your high performing academics, your high performing business people, they actually have practices that they use to regulate themselves to, in order to not just perform better, but sleep better, and not just to sleep better, but to listen better, not just listen better, but incorporate ideas that allow them into states of, of creativity and states of mind that really lead to new and exciting ways that humans can interact. And the, many people will just be consumers of everything they, yeah. they produce. As you can probably tell, I'm, I'm optimistic. Yeah. I have to be, uh, because otherwise I can't justify the work uh -huh. that we're doing. Uh, but I think that there's so much interest now in psychology and the brain and the self, in physical fitness, which you know I think it's fair to say is inextricably linked to mental fitness. And the fact that people are so curious about what other people are doing and what are the paths to su success and you know what are the resources for trauma and addiction. I think there's been a you know, kind of swarm of information. It's been hard to sort through, but I think 2020 is our, um, you know, is our sort of call, I keep yeah. calling it a call to arms. And I, cause I guess I, I do feel that way. It's very serious. This is, this is serious business. And this is the time for us and the next generation to step up and, you know, and to lead people toward a place where they, we can function better and where the next generation will reflexively function better. That's that beauty of early childhood is that if some of this stuff is taught and passed off, it's not gonna be perfect, but there'll be a generation of people coming up that will naturally understand stress and agitation as taking them off their game and leading to bad decisions and will make the appropriate adjustments. Mm. And there are people that will that read David's book and your book and will see the possibility of doing something differently with a, with a terrible childhood or a, a brutal addiction. And, you know, I think we, we need more stories of success. I think it's easy to look out there and see all the things that are going wrong and we need to keep paying attention to those, but we need these beacons that draw people forward. And I say that from a place of experience. I mean, I used to have to find it in books in the bookshelf. I, there was no online back then or in mentors and, you know, you have to forage. You know, I, I think mm -hmm. kids, they have to have that foraging capacity. They can't just sit there and wait for it to rain on them or for a parent to dump it on them. But I trust that they're out there and that they're gonna figure it out. I have a kind of no acronym rule, so I don't like embedding things in a lot of complex mm -hmm. language. Sometimes I have to use an acronym, but yeah, teach people a little bit about how their brain works, how it interfaces with psychology. Everyone's got different goals and, and purposes in the world, but um, you know that scientists are normal people and that hopefully science has something, I think really science has something to offer, but it's not gonna happen if I'm vaulted in my lab yeah. or my papers are read by the 12 people that care enough to read the paper start to finish. Right. So. I'm, I'm doing it. Um, there are others out there, of course. David Sinclair is doing it. Mm -hmm. Sachin Panda is doing it. Um, I'm trying to recruit more people from the scientific community to do this. I mm -hmm. think it's our responsibility. You paid for it. It's your tax dollars. You know, there's a tremendous cost to doing science that is not often discussed, but I don't really consider it an option. I consider it my obligation and I'm gonna keep going. Rapid pace technological advancements and our growing reliance on external aids characterize the modern world. It's all too easy to forget the simple, natural tools within us that have the potential to transform our well-being. This video reminds us of one such critical tool, our breath. This is not just about the involuntary act of breathing to survive, it's about consciously engaging with our breath, influencing its depth, rhythm, and pace, thereby using it as a powerful mechanism for self-regulation, healing, and vitality. So when the is very hard to control the mind with the mind. And I think a simple rule that people can adopt is when your mind is not where you want it to be, look to your body. Use the body to shift the mind. It's a simple 
equation, it's sometimes hard to do because thoughts can be so all encompassing. But when your mind is not where you want it to be, if you don't feel as happy or you're obsessing, you need to go to a mechanical system in the body because if you do that, you'll shift the chemicals that are released in your brain in a way that will allow you to regain control of the steering wheel. The video's emphasis on this conscious act allows us to recognize the latent power in our ability to control and manipulate our breath to foster health and wellness. This insight prompts us to reframe our perception of breathing from a passive activity to a proactive wellness strategy. If we are in a pretty relaxed state or if we are happy, we generally feel like we can do what we want to do. We can maneuver through our environment. We can make choices that are reasonable, but oftentimes we're not in relaxed and happy states. That's just part of the human experience, obviously. And there's a fundamental feature to the nervous system, which is this thing they call the autonomic nervous system, which is just fancy nerd speak for the components of your nervous system that raise your levels of alertness or bring them way down. Sometimes we hear fight or flight, rest and digest, but this system governs all that, but a lot more. And Basically what happens is when we are at the extremes of the autonomic, what I call seesaw, of very, very alert to the point of being really stressed or panicked or concerned, or if we are very close to sleep and we're drowsy and we're exhausted, at those points along the autonomic nervous system, our thoughts become a bit like a runaway train. You know, if you're very upset it's hard to talk yourself out of it. If you're stressed, it's hard to think yourself out of it. In fact, you can start doing all sorts of third personing and rationalization. You can call someone, you can text somebody. It's very hard to get yourself out of those states with thinking alone. The video shows how breathwork has its roots in practices and wisdom. These practices come from different traditions like the pranayama in Indian yoga and meditative breathing in Zen Buddhism. People in the past already knew that breathing could bring about positive changes and help with healing. So there are a couple things that can do that immediately. Um, the most basic one and the simplest one is going to be with respiration, with breathing. So breathing and the neurons that control breathing are so interesting because they are constantly working. They work reflexively all the time. They're working right now. If you're alive and you're listening to this, you, they're working. But unlike a lot of aspects of our brain body connection, we can grab a hold of it immediately and, and start tinkering with it. Like I can't say right now, hey, start digesting faster, Andrew, you know, or tell my intestines, hey, you know, slow down digestion, or I can't make my heart rate speed up just by telling it to, but I can slow down or speed up my breathing if I want to. So it lies at this bridge between the conscious and the unconscious mind. And I don't say this from any point or stance of philosophy. This is physiology. So if your mind is not where you want it to be, whether or not you're trying to sleep or work or focus or anything, I'm a big fan of this physiological sigh, which was discovered by physiologists in the 1930s. It's a double inhale through the nose and a long exhale that follows. The exhale can be done through the mouth or through the nose. If you're one of these people who can't breathe through your nose, you could do this all through your mouth. So it's just an inhale and then inhale again, even if you're just sneaking in a little bit more air and then long exhale. The physiological sigh is known to physiologists and neuroscientists as a way to offload a lot of what's called carbon dioxide and it immediately produces a, a heightened sense of calm or a reduced sense of stress and alertness. It's not gonna put you to sleep right away, but I'll just do it um, just by way of example so people can see since it always looks funny to breathe and you know, by example for some reason. And no, you don't have to close your eyes in order to breathe. Uh, you can breathe with your eyes open. So it's just... <sighs> Right? So it's inhale, inhale, long exhale. This ancient knowledge is still very, very important today because our modern society often faces problems like stress, anxiety, and mental health issues. It's inspiring to see the video connecting ancient wisdom with our present day needs. Well, I think that, you know, in terms of value of understanding the nervous system and where it can be steered, it's absolutely clear that the nervous system can change in response to experience. So this thing we call neuroplasticity is really that. It's the brain's ability to modify itself in response to uh -huh. experience. And I think it's important to understand that from birth till about age 25, the brain is extremely malleable in a kind of almost passive way where kids are exposed to things and the brain is just wiring up. I mean, the brain is really designed to adjust itself uh, in order to be 
in concert with its surroundings and to optimize that just the, the way we described a minute like ago. Like the way that mm -hmm. a child can learn a language very quickly or, or three languages. play the guitar or something like yeah, that. Yeah, without an accent. You know, right. three languages without an accent. It's remarkable. You try and do that after age 25. It's very challenging. And so the, the brain is basically designed to be customized in the early part of life and then to implement those algorithms and that circuitry for the rest of, your, of its life. And so the brain can change in adulthood and it can change provided that there's an emphasis on some perceptual event. So in other words, if you wanna change your brain as an adult, let's say you wanna be less anxious, you wanna learn a new language, you wanna be more functional in some way, presumably. The key thing is to bring focus to some particular perception of something that's happening during the learning process. And the reason for that is that there's a neurochemical system involving acetylcholine. And it comes from these two little nuclei down in the base of the brain called nucleus basalis. All day long, you're doing things in a reflexive way. But when you do something and you think about it very intensely, acetylcholine is released from basalis at the precise neurons that were involved in that behavior. And it marks those for change mm. during sleep or during deep rest later. So for people that wanna change their brain, the power of focus is really the entry point. And the ability to access deep rest and sleep. Mm. Because most people don't realize this, but neuroplasticity is triggered by intense focus, but neuroplasticity occurs during deep sleep and rest. And we can talk about how to optimize those different brain functions. One of the things that's really important also to think about how the brain works in terms of plasticity and all this stuff is what the brain really wants to do is also pass as much of what it does off to reflexive behavior as possible. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> yeah. so when we're talking about focus, I think it can get a little bit vague, but it might be useful to think about like what exactly is focus and what triggers plasticity. So the brain loves to be able to just do things, pick up coffee cups and drink and walk and talk and do things and not put much energy into it. When we decide to focus, what the brain really does is it switches on a set of circuits that involve the frontal cortex and nucleus basalis and some others. And it's trying to understand duration, how long something's gonna last, path, what's gonna happen, and outcome, what ultimately is gonna happen. So duration, path, and outcome. You know, the, the events of early 2020 are a good example of this. One of the reasons why it's so exhausting to be alive in 2020 is because we are now having to pay attention to duration, path, and outcome. How long is this thing gonna last? When are, you know, when are they gonna open up all businesses? Did I touch that door handle? Does it matter? You know, right. who are the experts? Are there any experts? You know, there are a lot of questions. Whereas normally we can just move through life without having to do all that analysis. Mm.